Welcome to Tell Me Your Truest Story. I'm Karen Miriam Goldberg. This monthly podcast focuses on exploring, unearthing, and at times revising the stories we tell ourselves and are told to find greater freedom, justice, wisdom, and homecoming. Explore with us ways to better align our narratives with our callings and the callings of our time and the living earth. Kevin Wilma, where do we even begin? How about at the beginning? Kevin grew up in Junction City, Kansas, a place aptly named because it's a junction of cultures and histories. Because of the nearby Army base, Fort Riley, Junction City mosaic brown, black, and indigenous peoples, as well as families from around the world in a swirl of Kansas hospitality, although it was surrounded by largely white communities where families rooted back generations. He said Junction City was and is, quote, the America that the fight is over now as a multiracial democracy. That influenced Kevin mightily, as well as the injustices he experienced and witnessed, prompting him to work as an organizer right out of college in Junction City, helping the homeless while also forcing the integration of some long-standing segregated institutions. But theater and film were always some of his big loves, and after graduating from the NYU Tisch School for the Arts, He found his groove as a screenwriter, as well as an actor, director, producer, and professor at the University of Kansas. Thanks to that last gig and his love of Lawrence, he lives here, a.k.a. center of the universe, but I could be biased. Some of Kevin's films include The Confederate States of America, a daring and disturbing parody on What If the South Won the Civil War. He's also written Ninth Street, an independent film starring Martin Sheen and Isaac Hayes about his experiences growing up in Junction City. His other films are pretty vast, but here's a sampling. The Battle for Bunker Hill, The Only Good Indian, starring Wes Studi, William Allen White, What's the Matter with Kansas, Jayhawkers, Destination Planet Negro, and a bunch of films he collaborated on with Spike Lee, including She-Rock, The Five Bloods, and KKKK Klansman, which won him an Oscar and thrilled our community and all who know him. He also adapted The Watsons Go to Birmingham. What I can tell you about Kevin is something many of us who know him already know. Kevin is a good man, a great guy, a generous soul who lifts up other artists, writers, musicians, and activists in hundreds of small, quiet acts. He's a family man in love with his wife, grown kids, and his first grandson. He's also kind enough to sit down for this interview with me. Thank you so much, Kevin, for being part of this podcast, and welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. So, hey, what is the story behind the story of why you became a storyteller through writing and film? I heard you say in one interview that you were a frustrated filmmaker as a kid because there was (laughs) no way to make films in Junction City, Kansas. But did you always know it was film or some kind of storytelling? Yeah, I think it was, I think it was probably film more more than anything, you know, that uh, we went to the movies, our neighborhood, we were kind of like the Cosby kids, you know, uh, except we weren't crazy you know we didn't have bill <laughs> we didn't have bill doing horrible things uh we and, the yes yes uh but you know you know the older guys would would kind of <laughs> take us younger guys my brother was part of the older guys and i would tag along with them and they we went to the movies you know every weekend and uh, we didn't go see Disney movies, man. They 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 beat you up in my neighborhood if you saw a Disney movie. But we went to see you know cowboy movies and 
and monster movies and dramas and I mean we just we saw we saw grown up movies and and you know James Bond and all, all that stuff and it was you know this is this would have been the the early '60s really and yeah you know, I was real little but but uh, you know we saw the Hercules movies and we called them sword fighting movies uh, they're kind of called sword and sandal movies now. But all of that stuff just made me really love movies. And the first movie I think that uh, I remember seeing kind of like thinking about how the movie was made was, was The Good, The Bad, and Ugly uh, with the Clint Eastwood, uh, Sergio Leone, Spaghetti Western. And, and so I think more than anything, I think just, just falling in love with movies um, you know, we watched a lot of television too. And, you know, back in those days it was three channels. And so you had to watch whatever was on. So we watched a lot of older movies. And so it just really kind of gave me a love for movies, which really then gave me a love for, for storytelling. Yeah. And so one thing led to another. So let's talk a little about Junction City. You know, I love Junction City because when I did Kansas Humanity gigs, especially in the 80s and early 90s there was this librarian there named carol franklin and she was just so blunt and <laughs> so efficient and wonderful she'd introduce me and say karen's here to talk about the book i hated it okay karen <laughs> no um and there was just this like the veneer was off and people were very real and really saying what they felt and a lot of that Kansas and I seem to be out the door, at least in that, in those rooms with older women in the library. But, yeah. Yeah. You were born in 1958 in Junction City. Yes. And for people who don't know, it's a town on the edge of a military base. It's a unique crossroads in the Midwest, incredibly diverse because of the Big Red One and the history of the Buffalo Soldiers and because military people from all over the world were there. How did that play shape who you are and the stories you're called to tell? Well, I think it was the neighborhood I grew up in, um, which was um, you, you know, my parents were not in the military. So we, you know, when you're not in the military in an army town, a military town, you have a very different experience. Uh, and so we were the, we were not in the military, but we were surrounded by people that were in the military, or re mainly retired military. And, and, and those Buffalo soldiers, you know, brought, they called them war brides and they brought their wives home from, you know, Italy and, and Germany and the Philippines and, and, and France and, you know, Vietnam and Japan and, and they had kids. And, and, and so there was a beautiful mixture of all kinds of folks, you know, black and Italian, black and German, black and Filipino you know, and everything in between. And, and that was my neighborhood. And, uh, and you quickly kind of found out that, that race mattered and race didn't matter. Uh, race mattered because you needed to know who you were. And, and we were all black because, you know, the, the rule from slavery is one drop makes you black. One drop of black blood makes you black. It's called the one drop rule. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we were all black and no matter how you looked, you were black. And, and then race didn't matter because, you know, we, you know, there's all these diverse folks and we were just kids. And, and, you know, my, one of my best buddies was Freddie Byers. He was, he was white and Japanese and, and, you know, race just didn't come up a lot. Uh, but, but we all knew, I think, in a way that we were, you know, most of us were poor and most of us, a lot of folks were, had, you know, difficult situations at home and, you know, all kinds of things. And, but as a whole, my neighborhood, my block, you know, which was incredibly diverse, uh, was a, was like a working, working class block. And, and my parents had, my father specifically had, been there for a long time and had built his home himself, you know, and I mean, literally built the house himself. He was a construction guy. And he, so he, he was able to build it with his friends. And I, I think all of that just kind of, you know, 
it was such a unique kind of experience. We, the school we went to was, was predominantly a white school, uh, you know, neighborhoods divided you up to what school you went to. And the one we ended up going to was Lincoln school, which was predominantly white, but you know, was, there was a lot of us there too. And so it was a healthy mix. And my father, who was an older man, when I was born, my father was born in 1898. He was 60 when I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and had been in Junction City as a kid, and uh, and it was integrated. The school was integrated when he was a kid. This would have been in the turn of the century. Wow! So, so it was. You know, Junction City was a really kind of unique place. I mean, it it had its, it definitely had oppression. It definitely had you know racism and all of that stuff. But then it had the exact opposite too, where it had freedom and and diversity and so it was a is a it's kind of the i would say i would argue that it was america it is the america that the fight is over now i mean yeah. literally literally junction city is a multiracial democracy and that's why you had september that's why you had january 6th is that you know america's fighting this multiracial democracy that has happened and is happening and people are you know people are scared of it and they're and now they're fighting all these different battles with, you know, critical race theory and not wanting people to teach history and, and all the madness that's happening now. Yeah, well, speaking of fighting reality, um, after you graduated from Marymount College in Salina, Kansas, according to your KU Bayou, you returned home and worked as a peace and civil rights activist fighting for the rights of the poor, creating two Catholic worker shelters for the homeless, and forcing the integration of several longstanding segregated institutions. What led you into that work, and what did you discover about the stories of people on and over the edges and what they were living? Sure. Um, well, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to cut to the chase. Um, you know, I was I was thrown out of high school. Uh, you know, there was a there was riots during my junior year, and we had a horrible principal there. He was horribly racist guy, and there was racist teachers that we had. We had you know some good teachers. We had unfortunately some some uh, some bad ones too, and it led to riots. And 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 so long story short, you know, I got thrown out of school, and I ended up in the Catholic school in town because I worked on the CETA program, which was a government program for poor kids. And it gave you a job in the summer. And I, and I worked kind of year round on that program. And my job was to cut the grass and we did various work at the Catholic cemetery in town. And, and, uh, and when I got thrown out of school, you know, they, they, uh, Mr. McCormick, who was the, the guy who kind of managed the cemetery, he, he helped to get me into St. Xavier School there in Junction City. And, and that's where I met uh, Father Frank Cody, who kind of a, a great priest, great, great, great friend of mine, my mentor, really. And he uh, kind of forced me to go to college. I mean, going to college was like going to the moon. The only people who went to college in my neighborhood were people that played sports. And so I went to college and, and there the, the, so I was already kind of an activist minded kind of person because of my experience with, with racism and, 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 you know, the older guys in the neighborhood. I remember you, you like this. I remember as a kid, when the, the riots were happening in Lawrence and they were, there were troops in Lawrence during the 60s, I think it might have been like 70 or something when when they burned the union down. And, and I re we talked about that, the like older guys were talking about that on my block in Junction City. And so, you know, you'd hear you'd hear these stories. And, you, and so it was like it was an interesting time because, you know, it, it kind of radicalized you in that sense. And it made you think about, you know, my mother, she always made us watch the news. And so I was very abreast of what was happening. And uh, and all of that kind of, you know, then when I got to Marymount College, uh, the the sisters of St. Joseph put the whammy on me. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were they were and still are, you know, beautiful women who fight for the poor and and do amazing work. And and so, you know, they kind of 
got me further into you know things like the captive worker movement and Dorothy Day and helping the poor and and you know fighting nonviolently uh, against things. And so when you know one of the jobs I had on the CETA program as a kid was I worked at the fire station and my boss was a firefighter and and uh, and he took me up to the fire station and fire fire houses are notoriously kind of racist places because they just had all this stuff that came out in New York City about, you know, firefighters making fun of George Floyd and how he was murdered and stuff. And and they're notoriously racist places because they're fraternities. And you and you you stay there for a couple of days and then you live in a dorm, which is the firehouse. And they had never had a firefighter in Junction City. And Junction City is the second largest black city in the state, percentage wise. Yeah. And they've never had a firefighter. And so when I got, a, and so when I, was, when I was in high school, I worked there. And when my boss took me up there, he said, we've never, you've never let a black person up here before. Oh my gosh. And, and so, and he kind of knew it was wrong. And he, and he kind of, you know, it was funny because when I got out of school, I launched a protest to integrate the fire department. And he saw he wasn't new, he was no longer a fire department, but he saw me and said, Hey Kevin, go get him, go get him hell. <laughs> you know? And uh and it was, you know, it just you, you know, you you here you you're in high school and you come back home, you know, for me it was like about six years later. I, I didn't go directly to college. I worked a couple of years and nothing had changed. And so you just felt like I needed to try to address some things when I got out of, out of school. So I, so I, we created some shelters there at the, at Injunction and, and um, I think people kind of discovered there were poor people in Junction City, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, wow, there's, I mean, there's homeless people in Junction City. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very invisible in towns like that, that the homelessness and, and the problems that people have. So all of that, you know, was kind of how I got involved in it. And I think I learned, I just learned the other end of America. I just learned to kind of, you know, embrace the, the other side of it. I, I grew up, you know, we, you know, I, we, we, I, I grew up, you know, not, we were poor, but we were, we were well off because we owned our home. My father had built our home. And, you know, by the time I was a kid, you know, I was on social security, you know? And so, uh, you know, we lived on $300 or something a month and, uh, we never had a car growing up, but, but we were like the rich people on the block, you know? And so it, it, it just, the whole thing kind of just taught me a lot about, about justice and society and life and race. And that's what I ended up kind of writing about. Well, that speaks to my next question. A lot of the films you write or co-write or adapt, they tell buried stories, stories not given the light of day because they're, you know, they're stories of people of color or people who are otherwise um, disadvantaged or hidden or silenced. And more to the point, you really look at the deep price of systematic racism. And I'm thinking of satires like the Confederate States of America, as well as the adaptation of the Watsons go to Birmingham. Sure. I remember reading that book to our kids. And we loved it. And originals like The Only Good Indian. You also say we should write what we believe in. So what rings through you that tells you to commit to telling these buried stories? And how do you sense in the course of each film what you're hoping audiences, um, people of color as well as white audiences will get from a particular film? Well, I think uh, all of that kind of comes from a belief that, that, and this is kind of what I think educated me as a kid. Um, you, you know, I grew up, especially watching on television, what was called problem pictures. And problem pictures were movies that they started in the late 40s after World War II to really, you know, the early 70s um, that dealt with the problem of race or dealt with, you know, anti-Semitism or they dealt with, you know, various social issues, problems, uh, poverty, things like that. Uh, but, but the ones that really 
you know, obviously the Sidney Poitier movies are the big ones, movies like The Defiant Ones and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and, and you know, a lot of other smaller films that, that you know, Stanley Kramer directed a lot of them or produced them. And those movies, I, I found that watching those movies as a kid, I, I, I learned a lot about race from, from watching those movies. And, and movies taught me also a lot about history. So I was always a history nut to a history nerd. And so it kind of, all of those things kind of came together to kind of, kind of create um, uh, my approach, I, I guess you'd say, to, to filmmaking. Uh, I, I believe that, I like to believe, I want to believe that movies can, can help the cause, that people can learn from movies and that they can, uh, movies can help people grow. And I always like to say, you know, we try to make the invisible visible. You try to, that's what activism often tries to do. Any kind of vi visual um, kind, uh, visual approach to something is trying to make something that oftentimes is invisible, visible. So, so that's, that's kind of been my, my whole shtick is um, really trying to take stories, especially history stories, especially those that that are buried history or the difficult parts of history. And I think when I made, when I made CSA, that really influenced me a great deal because I, I, from making that film, I learned how much America does not, wants to avoid its history and, and, and how important our history is because as I mentioned earlier, right now it's, it's, it's come full circle because uh, the fight is literally is over our history. I mean, the fight is literally over you know, our, when you learn our history, you it it's disturbing quite often, and yeah. it's upsetting, and people feel uncomfortable, and that's what I learned with with good satire is always discomfort. If if I'm not making you uncomfortable, I'm not doing my job, and and now you see these people with this critical race theory stuff saying, you know, I don't want to make a white kid uncomfortable. Or black kid, you know, got to remember, black kids are uncomfortable about hearing the history too, because they don't want to hear about slavery and how they're oppressed and all the bad things that happened. And but we have to hear it because it's critical to um, living in a multiracial democracy. So for me, it kind of all connects up together in that sense that you can't have a just society, you can't have a democracy that works, you can't really have. Um, you don't really get an answer to the, the problems that have always plagued us in this country without being honest about where we've been and where we're trying to go. And, 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 there's, and that's the fight right now. It's been the fight for, for a long time, but it's now become really the big fight. I mean, Republicans, you know, they're, they're, they don't believe in democracy anymore because it's becoming a multiracial democracy. And that's why they don't believe it. They think as they say, Jews will not replace us. They feel like they're being outnumbered, yeah. and and that they're then that the, that the races are taking over, and so it's it's a really scary, critical time right now. Well, given how scary and a time it is, and how critical it is, um, and I really hear what you say about making the invisible visible related to this, and also what's visible visible that people are just ignoring, right. All of this kind of gives you a huge range of projects you could work on. Yes. So how do you choose what to take on that giving a, you know, doing a film is such a massive take everything you have and then some enterprise. And also related to this, how do you keep your center with an ear to the work that calls when dealing with backlashes like the hate mail you got around doing the CSA film? Sure. Well, you know, I think um, I'll, I'll take the, the backlash first and then, then we'll talk about the, how you choose things. I, I, the backlash, uh, it's funny, I think I learned, yeah, I learned about the backlash when I went to Marymount because I, my, my, my mentor there, my drama teacher, his name was Dr. Dennis Denning, great, great, great man. Uh, you know, he gave us public criticism every night after the play. And he would talk about what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. 
and be in front of it, the whole cast. And it was, it was, it was great. It was great. I mean, you know, it, it was scary and you were worried that he'd say something that, you know, embarrass you or hurt your feelings. But it was great because it prepared you kind of for the public arena. And so, and then when I did activism in Junction City, when I got out of school, I was in the paper almost every day and they were talking about me like a dog because the newspaper was, was against, you know, was, was pro, <laughs> pro keeping the fire department white. <laughs> you know? And so uh, all of that really taught me about not letting backlash affect you um, artistically, um, as an activist, as you know, when you get in a public arena, this stuff just doesn't mean anything. And, uh, and so that's, that's really, that's really helped me a great deal in, in hate mail. I mean, I, I got hate mail from wearing the bulletproof vest as a protest against the crazy, you know, policy of, of, of you know, telling students to bring guns on campus at, at KU and, and all the other schools in the state. Uh, you know, I've gotten so much various kinds of hate mail. It just doesn't, it doesn't, I don't even look at it. I mean, sometimes I get a thing from, I, I, I well, I'll look at it, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't upset me, you know. Uh, it's just kind of the reality of it. And uh, I remember, I think with the, with the with the with the bulletproof vest protest it was you know somebody like did a real threat against me or something they had to let me know there was a, a real like a real threat against you and you know and you know it, it, it that's just kind of part of the territory and if you and yeah. if you count if you count you don't count the cost about those things that you know you just won't do anything you believe in really and um, so I, I, I kind of, I kind of, you know, I kind of learned those lessons kind of a long time ago. Um, in terms of picking the projects, um, you know, it's, it's such a great question because there, there's a couple of realities that people I don't think understand about film specifically, and 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 you nailed it with your way you phrased the question because film is is such a money driven thing such a budget driven reality that you know the the projects i i write for you know studios or hollywood or whatever I, those projects are are, are are chosen because they can pay me and there's a, a a better possibility of them being made so you know that's kind of the criteria unfortunately i mean you, you know you you, you just it, it takes so much time when you work on a script that you don't want to do all that work and then have it go nowhere. And so, you know, the movies I make myself, I would, I would have to then choose, you know, based on several different criteria, uh, obviously the, my, my passion for the subject, but then can I, can I get the movie made? Can I find enough money to, to shoot the movie? And, uh, and so when I write the script, I would be writing it to shoot the movie. So I'm writing it within the, for the budget, I think I can maybe raise. So all of those things are, you know, very different than the, than the Hollywood projects because the Hollywood projects, you know, they approach me and they say, are you interested in this? And, uh, and so then I have to kind of choose, um, you know, I get approached, approached a lot of great stories, but most of them don't have any money attached to them yet. And they're trying to get it made. And uh, so, you know, I, 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 you know, that kind of answers the answers the question for you in that sense. If you, does that make sense? Absolutely. And this kind of leads me to another question I just thought of um, the Oscar. And I have to say, one of my very favorite things about anybody winning an Oscar ever is when people asked what you were wearing and you said weavers, you know, from downtown Lawrence. Um, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> no, but um, how has winning an Oscar changed things or hasn't changed things? Well, you know, I think uh, my name is a lot more well known now in the business and, um, and I, I, I kind of work nonstop now. Um, uh, 
you know, it's, it's still hard to do what you want to do. I mean, you know, that's always the, the tough thing about the industry is that you can work nonstop, but it, but you don't get to always do what you want to do. Fortunately, I get handed because I kind of, you know, I won the award for Black Klansman, which is a certain kind of film, which kind of is based in the kind of movies that I make and that I care about and the stories that I write best probably. And so most of the projects I get approached for are of that, of that nature. And so all of that is, is good because, you know, I get to kind of work on what I really care about. Um, the tough thing is that that's still a challenge is that the stuff that, that you want to do that are your, the stories that I want to tell specifically, you know, you still have to go through, you know, the, the, the challenges of, of, you know, finding the money and all of that stuff. And, and so it's, it, it, I'm so busy with the projects for hire these days that I have a harder time, you know, finding time to do kind of what I want to do. And I'm, I'm going to try to get back to more of that in, in, in soon, I hope. What you're saying makes me think of our mutual friend, Stan Hurd, who does those giant earthworks projects that you can see from the air. Yes. And how Stan will balance a commercial project like Absolute Vodka with something else, like um, perhaps the image of John Lewis across the field as a way to make it go. And it sounds like you're facing a similar balance, the work you like well enough that you can get paid decently for, and the work you really are passionate about, but then you have to pull together all the finances and resources for. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that's that's kind of always been, that's been, the, Stan and I talk about that all the time. And that's kind of been the challenge we've had for a long time, even before, I won the award that was kind of the challenge really and and that's the challenge for you know artists that have kind of their own agenda as well i mean you know a lot of times people artists tend to just work on things that you're you know commissioned to do or, or whatever uh but there's other times when the stan what stan does is is very much like a movie i mean it's a big project and you have to have resources and and you know it's just you just can't it's not a painting in your you know you can do in your studio and so uh that makes it that makes it more difficult and 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 makes it you know more challenging to and it's not even so much sometimes the 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 work to make the movie as it is the time to really write the script you know and and the script that you want to write about what you want the story that you want to tell and and that's kind of been one of the big challenges for me these days is just having time to to write the story that I want to write you know and uh uh and it's and, and you know my but my buddy Matt Cole always says there's no quite no no whining on the yacht so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> crying here. Don't, 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 don't cry for me, Argentina. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, uh, um, I'm, it's, I'm very fortunate uh, to have this problem, you know? Well, and that also speaks to right livelihood. And I think we're both passionate about that. And of course the old Buddhist definition is work that does no harm or in more contemporary terms, work that serves our community, helps us grow our gifts and makes us work like crazy with our edges. How do you see your work as a filmmaker, writer, teacher, which we haven't touched on yet, collaborator, not to forget activist and rabble rouser? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, I've done it for so long. It's kind of, it's the, the nice thing now is I get, I get invited to kind of make speeches now and, and people kind of know, you know, what I do and who I am and, and all of that. And, um, and that's, that's, I, I really enjoy that part of my life as well, because uh, it allows me to, to, to think outside of, of my work and think about, you know, society and political things and, and race and all of that. And it kind of keeps you connected to the ongoing struggle that's happening in the country. And because it's such a, 
a unique moment in our history right now and and people are gonna you know I, you know people aren't writing about it you're not seeing movies about you know trump or that stuff so much yet because there's there's not an ending yet and yeah. and there's no the third act hasn't been written yet and the and everything you know is the the dark the the dark night of drama is still kind of going on right now but um when when that's over um you know it's it that's going to probably happen more and when when the story's finally the story finally ends with this mad chapter of american life you can you kind of get to hear that story and so that's that to me is kind of you know that's where it all mixes up because i mean i i had a it's so funny i had a a script I, I wrote that I wanted to do is almost like a CSA part two. And it was called President Joe. And it was about Joe McCarthy, the senator from Wisconsin, the McCarthyism guy. Uh, he becomes president. And, uh, and, uh, and the problem I had with the script is that even I was going to do, you know, kind of like with CSA, when you see political ads and stuff from you know, the people that, that were influenced by McCarthy and all of that. And, and unfortunately, you can't, I, every time I'd write some crazy scene, then it would happen in real life. And, and I could not compete against uh, the realities of what was actually going on. <laughs> and it was, and it's, it's hard to satire things when real life is is crazier than you can kind of make it in the story and you can't you can't top kind of what's actually happening right now you know uh or at least you know you feel like you can i mean you go further out and then you go back home and then you see some other crazy thing on the news that's actually the same thing like i for instance I'll just give you a concrete example i i you know i i had a sarah palin type character that i was that i'd written and she was firing a machine gun and and these uh, illegal, you know, undocumented uh, folks were running, and she was talking about, you know, shoot them over the wall and get back over the wall. And now, now that's a common Republican commercial for people running for office is them shooting a machine gun in the ad. I mean, it's just. I mean, I saw another one just the other day, and 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 it's like. The, the you can't keep up with the insanity of it and and so that that part of it is is been a, a unique struggle for me because um it, it's like you feel like stephen king can't keep up with the horror of, of real life i was like i'm trying to scare you but but the stuff that's happening outside your house i can't top it <laughs> you know so it's a it's a it's a unique time well related to that you know, you're an educator, you, you're a professor at KU. How does that fit into your right livelihood? Well, you know, I, I've always loved teaching. Uh, and, and it's always, I always feel a little selfish about it because I, I've always felt like I've, I've benefited from it as much as the students probably benefit from it. Uh, I think more than anything, you know, it's, it's just fun talking to uh, students and, you know, anyone that takes the classes uh, uh, about just, you know, the, 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 you know, the subject matter. I mean, you know, it, it, it's like when you have to explain things to others, you kind of understand it more yourself. And, and in that sense, it's, it's, I've always really, just in really enjoy teaching. I, I don't, I only teach a class in the summer now, uh, teach a, like a three day kind of class in the summer because my, that's one of the things that the, the, the award has kind of done is that it's, I just don't have as much time to, uh, to teach anymore. Uh, but uh, I still do teach a, a class in the summer, uh, but the demands of, of the industry have kind of uh, taken most of my time. That makes complete sense. And I also kind of wonder about how this other thing influences you that you've mentioned a few times, you know, that your father was 60 when you were born. And you said in several interviews that um, 
you kind of just grew up around a lot of older people, people who had a much more, you know, visceral historic connection to slavery and those stories. How did being surrounded by people with so many decades of stories kind of speak to the stories you tell? Yeah, that was a, that was a big one for me. Um, you know, there was Mr. Hammond and the Hammonds are kind of a, they were like, I think one of the, the, the first family of black family in Junction City, or one of the first black families to settle in Junction City. And I recently, I know a while back, I had a relative, his name was Oscar, who um, was ran out of the South by the Klan and came to Junction City. And that's how my family got to Junction City, uh, my father's family. And, and I think that, you know, Mr. Hammond would come, he lived down the street from us. And he'd come up in the evening and he would talk to my mother and my father and he brought, he would bring the Kansas City newspaper up, the Kansas City Star up for us to read. And, uh, and, and just hearing, I, you know, as a kid, you know, you're just sitting in the living room and, and they're talking and you, you didn't, you know, you didn't get to, to talk you just had to listen. And, and, and so it was just interesting. It was just fascinating to kind of hear them talk about things. And one of the things they talked a lot about was Ninth street, which was the, the, the red light district in Junction city. And my mother and father met on Ninth street and uh, my father we used to go down there to gamble. And my mother ran a pool hall on Ninth street. And, and, and they talked about Ninth Street like an old friend. And that, that would become kind of a, 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 a play I wrote at, at Marymount College and that could become my first film. And that, then that play got me into NYU um, dramatic writing program at, at New York University. And all of that grew out of, of listening to them in my, my living room. And, you know, and it was, kind of just, I mean, because again, I, I kind of grew up appreciating history, but I think you also learn a lot about just about human life, about just struggle and about what people go through and how things happened and how Junction City kind of worked for black folks. And, uh, you know, again, the military and, um, my mother knew all the hustlers on Ninth Street. Um, for instance, when I was in junior high, uh, there was a woman who was a prostitute and she had twins by uh, what's called a trick, a, a John. Yeah. And in, in the hustle world, that's called a trick baby. And so she had these two, she had these twins and she came to my mother and she was still hustling. And she wanted my mother to take care of these kids for her. So my mother took the two children into our home and they lived with us for a year. So they stayed in, they were babies. They, they was, we had this big, big crib in our front room and both of them slept in this crib in our front room. And, uh, and I learned from my mother about, you know, she said she's a prostitute. And, and, but you give her all the respect you give anybody else. Wow. And, uh, and I learned that, you know, that just about respect and about not judging people for what they go through in life. And, uh, and that was a big, big, big part of, of growing up for me. And when, when those babies, when the lady, the mother came for them, you know, about a year. My, my mother just cried. It was, so, it was so tough for her to let those kids go. And uh, so it was things like that growing up, just seeing how my parents, my mother specifically, um, the, the kind of morals and ethics and belief system they had, which was contrary to everything else you were really taught. It was contrary to all the things that, churches said and that and that um you know you, you saw you saw in movies you know you kind of always saw the 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 prostitute with the golden heart 
but you didn't get to see them with kids and and needing your help and all of that and so that that's that made a that had a big influence on me. well that's kind of one way of really showing and seeing the buried stories and there's all these stories we think we're living and then we find out something different and for me nothing has kicked my ass or challenged me as much as uh as to revise the stories I thought I was living as being a mother, although my oh. kids are in their twenties and thirties, like it never ends. So, so you're a father and a grandfather too. What have you discovered about yourself in those roles? Well, you know, that's probably the biggest challenge of your life, right? I mean, yeah, it's, uh-huh. it's, 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 it's a, it's a constant challenge really. And, and it's a constant challenge because you can't live your life for your kids. You can't live their life for them. You know, you, you, when you see, you know, we all make mistakes. And when you see your kids making mistakes, you see your kids having problems and you, you want to solve them for them and you, and you can't. And so you, you got to give them the freedom to learn. And, and that's, that's a hard thing. You know, I mean, that's, you think about your parents and what they went through I think about my parents when I was thrown out of high school and, and my father was one of those kind of guys that didn't talk much. And he just, he worked really hard. He gave me a great work ethic, but he didn't, he didn't say much. And, and then when I heard years later, I heard uh, a guy that worked with him say that when you were thrown out of school, he said, your father was really hurt by that. And, um, he never showed me that never said it never you know but that's kind of the thing that you you learn as you grow older and you have kids and there's so many things that when you have kids you don't understand until you have kids and and that's I think that's just a a reality of it there's things you talk to people about that they can't really understand because they don't have kids and 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 it's and I think it's just it just when you have kids it changes everything and uh for good and bad and uh but it just puts you in another space that you don't have to be in if you don't have kids does that make sense oh yeah yeah and I know some of my friends who don't have kids they get their ass kicked from other things so we always have our challenges that show up right exactly and and I and I don't I'm not trying to say that as if you know not having kids makes people not know what's up. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that I think when when you know you just get a whole new set of problems when you have kids. <laughs> Whatever path you choose, you'll get a whole new set of problems. So I have yeah, one yes, more indeed. question for you. Uh, there's an endless amount to despair about every which direction these days. But where do you find signs or glimpses of the world we're capable of making or living? What gives you hope? Well, I think history gives me hope. You know, I, you know, history can be a, a tricky one to gain hope from. Um, the fact that we're still here says a lot. You know, the fact that we have not done ourselves in yet. Um, I mean, when you look around and you kind of go, well, of all the crazy mess that specifically America has done to itself. It's amazing that we, we're still as well off as we are. I mean, that's kind of an amazing thing when you think about it. I think about my father's life, you know, uh, I remember shortly before he died, my mother was in the hospital and, and I was taking him to go see my mom at the hospital. And he said to me, you know, when he was looking out away from the hospital, he said, we used to ride in wagons out here. And, and, you know, you go from, you know, a hundred years ago when my father was riding in a wagon black in a place where, you know, he only had the rights that someone wanted to give him. And then you get to, you know, president Obama and, 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 you know, me winning an Academy Award and all the things that are not supposed to happen in life. Um, you know, when, when, when we were kids, we always joked about 
if there was a black president, they'd shoot him the next day. That was always the joke. And the fact that that happened and he survived and um, because, you know, America loves to kill its leaders. um, That was that that gave I think that's kind of been a double edged sword because, you know, you hear people you hear people use that as if, you know, that example is if, you know, we've arrived in America. and, And to me, it's it's kind of one of those examples of, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it proves that we can do great things in the country. And then the backlash that came from President Obama proved that we are still got this huge struggle ahead of us. So, so I guess I kind of, you know, I don't get too far up and I don't get too far down. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I see the positive around me all the time. Uh, I, I kind of have learned to take the positive from the fight itself. And I think that's a big one because I don't think the fight's ever going to end. And, and the fight that we've got now is the fight that, you know, a hundred years from now we'll probably still have and in a new form and about new things, but, uh, but it'll be a good fight. Because, you know, hopefully with a little luck, you know, virtue will, will, will hold out and the values that we're fighting for now will, will be the ones that are still being maintained. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And what you say at the end reminds me of something I sometimes tell Ken, my husband, we won't know the good we've done until after we're dead, but we try to treat each other well along the way. And- Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Tell Me Your Truest Story. Please subscribe to my podcast at KarenMiriamGoldberg.Podbean.com or visit my website for the link to find out more about workshops, writings, happenings, and my latest blog post at KarenMiriamGoldberg.com. That's C-A-R-Y-N-M-I-R-R-I-A-M-G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G. You can also find Tell Me Your Truest Story on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Special thanks to Kelly Hunt for the use of her music from our co-written song, The Road is Just a River. And please catch up with more of Kelly's music at kellyhunt.com that's kelly with two e's k-e-l-l-e-y thank you to diana burrup for our logo may you find greater truth and joy peace and wonder in your own truest stories